Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at my favorite pre-scream 90s horror film, Candyman, which came out in 1992. Based on a story called The Forbidden by Clive Barker, the beautifully horrific mind that brought us Hellraiser, Candyman is about an urban legend brought to life. Masterfully directed by Bernard Rose, and featuring one of my favorite horror scores ever, composed by Philip Glass, Candyman is a thoughtful and sometimes dreamlike film that never beats you over the head with the message, despite the myriad themes it explores. So in that regard, it's kind of like the opposite of a Purge movie. Although Candyman is about a dude with a hook for a hand, which he uses to kill anybody who calls for him in the mirror, Candyman is not the cheesy slasher that this premise may suggest. Instead, it's an ethereal slow burn that becomes darkly romantic in the vein of Phantom of the Opera, as the titular man of myth pursues a grad student, played by Virginia Madsen, with such an intensity and passion Passion, he'll do anything to make her follow him into death. Candyman is the best-known role of prolific actor Tony Todd, whose over 200 credits include the mysterious William Bloodworth from the Final Destination series. He also sat down with me for my favorite interview to date, so make sure you check that out on Crypt TV's Meetup. We had a great time talking about Thai food and imagining what it'd be like if he were in Rosemary's Baby. Todd would reprise the iconic role for this film's two sequels, which eventually do become the cheesy slasher you may have expected, and which we'll be looking at over the next couple of weeks. After all, there's no better time for a bunch of candy than October, right? The sequels will give us more kills and backstory, but before we can get to them, we've got to start where it all began, in the rundown Chicago public housing project Cabrini Green. How many kills will we get from the Seaman in Chi-Town? Let's find out and get to them. The movie begins with a title card, and some dope-ass music by Philip Glass. Glass's score, which used only a piano, an organ, and some haunting choral vocals, goes perfectly with the gothic elegance of the film, to borrow a phrase from Tony Todd. Shit, it sounds like the Phantom himself is pounding away at those keys. Hell yeah! How about we follow that up with some bees? And a message from the Candyman as to what he's gonna do with that handy hand. What's blood for, if not for shedding? With my hook for a hand, I'll split you from your groin to your gullet. What an excellent way to immediately establish this movie's tone. Not sure what's up with the biblical bee swarm over Chicago, though. Grad student Helen Lyle listens as a story is told to her about a babysitter in Indiana whose poor judgment wasn't limited to getting naked with greaser Ted Raimi. It also extended to her summoning the hook-handed Candyman by saying his name five times in a mirror. That's right! Candyman is summoned by saying his name five times, not three. Common mistake, but three is more of a Bloody Mary thing. Even though she she has the opportunity to stop after four, like Raimi there does, this babysitter Clara goes all the way and says his name a fifth time by herself. Candyman. And then... She turned out the lights. <laughs> and died! Yeah, we'll count Claire on the list, even though the veracity of this death is pretty dubious, what with this being an urban legend and all. And yeah, I know the student telling the story mentions a baby being killed too, but we never saw that fictional baby to begin with, so it stays off the count. Helen is collecting these urban legends with her friend Bernadette, played by Casey Lemons, who had just in the previous year been in another esteemed horror film, Silence of the Lambs. They're recording these stories as research for their thesis project on urban urban legends at the University of Illinois, where Helen's husband Trevor already teaches as a professor. Trevor is played by Xander Berkeley, who you may know as a beleaguered foster father or a cowardice survivor outpost leader, and he's pretty damn friendly with his students, especially the pretty ones like the Stacy chick. Don't shake that homewrecker's hand, Helen, you know what's going on here. You don't really think. No, of course not. Of course, yes, girl! Helen transcribes her interview about Candyman, which is overheard by a custodian named named Henrietta. Henrietta and her friend Kitty tell Helen about a woman named Ruthie Jean, who was recently murdered, ostensibly by Candyman. She was killed with a hook. But unlike these working class women, Helen and Bernadette don't believe that Candyman is real, and to prove it to each other, they both say his name in the mirror, although Helen ends up all alone for the fifth recital. Candyman. 
Oh, you chicken! <laughs> the next day, the two of them take Helen's red car to Cabrini Green, which is where Ruthie Jean was murdered. Although Bernadette is appropriately anxious, Helen is determined to write a kick-ass thesis and learn why this community is attributing some of its murders to a fictional mythical man. Cabrini Green, a central part of this movie, was a public housing project in Chicago that, in real life, was indeed a site of violent gang activity for many a decade. According to Tony Todd, there were five different gang gang factions operating there while they shot the movie. Production had to pay them off in order to shoot the exterior scenes, and they even used some of them to portray the Cabrini Green residents suspicious of Helen and Bernadette when they arrived. These dudes here are actual gang members, wearing their own clothes to play these parts, although their dialogue was dubbed in later by post-production voice actors known as Loop Group. Apparently, those efforts weren't enough to entirely avoid any incidents, though, because Casey Lemons recalls a bullet being found in the production generator, and producer Alan Pohl says that on their last day of shooting, their camera truck was shot. In the nearly three decades since Candyman was filmed, the area's crime rate has gone down, and the last of Cabrini Green's high-rises was demolished in 2011. This kind of brings me to a point that no discussion of Candyman could ever go without. The movie obviously deals with race and came out during a tumultuous time. 1992 was the same year the LA riots happened in the wake of the Rodney King trial. Despite the NAACP giving Bernard Rose their blessing to make it, Candyman receives occasional criticism for its handling of race. After all, although it features a kick-ass black horror villain to join the genre's esteemed pantheon, it also sometimes falls back on tropes that can be seen as harmful. There's a great special feature on the Blu-ray called Unwrapping Candyman, where authors Tanana Reeve Du and Stephen Barnes discuss Candyman's complex relationship with race. And there are also countless articles and essays on the same subject available online. I don't have the expertise or experience to talk about that kind of stuff, especially in a kill count, but I encourage you to do further research if you're interested. There's a lot to be learned from this movie. In exterior shots filmed on location, Helen and Bernadette make their way way past some residents who immediately presume them to be cops. Hands up, people! Five more, coming out the back door! Police! Helen thinks that being mistaken as cops will give them some protection, so with that in mind, and because the rest of the scene was all filmed on a studio set, she feels safe enough to take pictures of everything she finds. Like this Hamlet quote, graffiti down the wall, sweeps to the suite, and this awesome metal door. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention that this movie actually has quite a few jump scares. I won't be too mean about them, though. They go to the bathroom where Ruthie Jean was killed, reportedly by Candyman coming out of her mirror. But Helen discovers that behind Ruthie Jean's mirror is another apartment. And although Bernadette warns her against it, she climbs on through to see what's on the other side. In this abandoned unit, Helen finds a kick-ass open mouth mural of the Candyman that she just crawled out of. And even just the sight of that thing leaves Helen feeling faint. Maybe I've some of that candy there for a little energy boost. Oh, on second thought, maybe don't do that. Since Helen's out of film for her camera, she and Bernadette go to leave, only to run into a resident named Anne Marie on their way out. She's the one with the jump scare dog. She's also got a widow baby named Anthony, who she's just trying to raise here despite the reputation this building's residents have. We ain't all like them assholes downstairs, you know? After bonding with Helen over her baby, Anne Marie, played by Vanessa A. Williams, opens up and tells Helen that when Ruthie Jean was murdered, she heard it through the walls. Now she's afraid for herself and her child, cause they ain't never gonna catch him. Hmm. Candyman. Helen and Bernadette have a smoky dinner with Trevor and another professor named Philip Purcell. Purcell also studies urban legends and gets excited when he hears that the ladies went to Cabrini Green. Candyman country. Turns out this dude has already written a paper on Candyman, which qualifies him to deliver a lengthy monologue of exposition. As Purcell pertells it, Candyman was the son of a slave who was able to raise the young candy boy in polite society thanks to money he made creating a device to mass manufacture shoes. Can you even imagine getting rich from making shoes? What a crazy way to make money, says the guy who counts kills for a living. Candyman took to the canvas and became a painter of portraits of wealthy people's families. He and one of his 
painting subjects, a young white woman fell in love. And when she became pregnant, her enraged father led a lynch mob that killed Candyman, right on the spot where Cabrini Green stands today. They proceeded to saw off his right hand with a rusty blade. But wait, there's more! As Helen turns into a film noir character, Purcell continues and says that Candyman's bloody body was smeared with smashed honeycombs, causing a billion bees to stab him straight to death. Helen is mystified and returns to Cabrini Green to take more pictures of the Candyman artwork there. On her way out, Helen goes to see Anne Marie again, but it doesn't look like anyone's home. <laughs> Except her jump scaring dog, that is. Helen instead tries to talk to this little kid Jake, played by 11 year old Dewan Guy, although he's not eager to divulge in the dialogue she's looking for. I can't say nothing. A candy man a get me. She promises to keep their conversation a secret, so Jake agrees to take her outside, past a giant heap of wood he says is for an upcoming bonfire, and up to a small bathroom building. Jake tells Helen that a kid was maimed inside when Candyman castrated him with his hook. Helen, ever the brave skeptic, heads inside the bathroom and finds some stinky sweets on the wall. Fun fact, the gross excrement there was made of chocolate and ginger biscuits by makeup artist Bob Keen. Helen follows an arrow on the wall wall in a stall to discover a toilet full of bees, buzz. While she's taking pictures of that pee hive, a man in a trench coat enters. And don't look now, but he's got a hook in his hand. Whoa, and a whole crew? I didn't know Candyman rolled so deep. Helen tries to talk her way out of this situation, but in this case, her luck has finally run out. I hear you looking for Candyman, bitch. Well, you found him. Helen is beaten, mostly off-screen, and discovered by Jake in the bathroom before the scene cuts away with some excellent comedic editing. We're here looking for Candyman, bitch. Step back. Great cut there, probably the funniest moment of the movie. Helen, whose eye is looking real nasty, successfully picks her assailant out of the lineup, and with her bruised eyewitness testimony, this dude Detective Valento is finally able to put the criminal away. The police are happy about that, since this guy's the one who's been calling himself Candyman and who murdered Ruthie Jean after climbing through her medicine cabinet. With the man behind the moniker arrested, Helen tells Jake that he has nothing left to worry about, because Candyman isn't actually real, he was just a myth being used as a cover story. Candyman ain't real? No. A few days later, after Helen gets her camera film back from Bernadette, she has an unexpected visitor in the parking garage. Helen. Yes? Oh snap, it's finally time! Nearly halfway into this movie, we're treated to the arrival of the actual motherfucking Candyman. Helen, I came for you. Oh, and with that dope-ass trench coat, courtesy of costume designer Leonard Pollock, there is no way Helen can turn down that proposal. Candyman walks towards her, admonishing her for doubting his existence, and making her cry with nothing more than the power of his voice. Well, and his devilish good looks. Be my victim. Not a problem, man. You don't have to ask me twice. Be my victim. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm all down for it, dude. How could anyone say no to you? I mean, maybe if they've got a major bee phobia, then things could get a little dodgy, I guess. Helen's reaction to the Candyman was filmed in a pretty unorthodox way. Bernard Rose knew he didn't want Helen Lyle to scream at the sight of him, since that was so cliche and also, according to him, kind of obnoxious. It's very annoying to watch people screaming. It's a Fucking horrible noise, too. Instead, he wanted her to be completely transfixed by the Candyman. And to achieve such an enraptured appearance, Rose took Virginia Madsen to an actual hypnotist. Despite her initial skepticism, it ended up working on her. The next thing I know, I'm, you know, I'm having this conversation with the hypnotist. And at some point, I realized that my arm was like this. And I have no conscious memory of putting my arm up. And I was like, no, that's super creepy. Let's do it again. And so for any shot where Madsen looks completely out of it, chances are she was actually hypnotized since the hypnotist gave Rose a word to use on set whenever they needed Helen to fall under Candyman's spell. It was one of many eccentric things Rose did during production and it sometimes left Madsen feeling very disoriented. Once he would start hypnotizing me, I was not very aware of my surroundings. I really couldn't see the crew. I could see the light lights and all the lights became very very blurry because my pupils would be dilated and pretty much the only thing I could hear 
was Bernard. Eventually, after a day of shooting that she was unable to recall in any way, she decided to call it quits on the technique. By the end of it, I was like, you know what? I can't do it anymore, Bernard. Don't come near me with that look on your face, because I'm not going under. Helen apparently passes out from Candyman's aura, since she wakes up on a bathroom floor covered in a jacket and lots of blood. But don't worry, Helen, it's not your blood, it's just the blood of Anne Marie's dog over there. Helen stupidly picks up the bloody cleaver on the ground and follows Anne Marie's screams into a bedroom, where she finds her rocking an empty bloody crib. Anne Marie sees and attacks Helen, assuming her to have kidnapped baby Anthony. Helen's able to defend herself with that cleaver but she's looking like quite the aggressor when the police come in and break up the fight. Helen is arrested and taken to the police station to get processed by a cop played by Rusty Schwimmer, previously seen on the kill count as both the angry diner owner in Jason Goes to Hell and the sweet secretary of John Gallagher Jr. in the Belko experiment. The king of cartoons tells Helen that she's under arrest for attacking Anne-Marie, killing her dog, and kidnapping her baby. Trevor's not home when she calls him around 3 a.m., but he does pick her up the next morning and takes her back home where they talk to her lawyer. Now they haven't charged you because they think they'll find the body. Oh what, the baby body? I know where it is. It's hanging out in the B building. Helen doesn't know that yet though, so she's unable to provide any info that would make her seem less guilty and or crazy. Trevor steps out to pick something up from work, yeah okay, and Helen passes the time by drinking, smoking, and looking at a slideshow of the pictures from her camera. In one of them, she sees Candyman. No, not the cool mural of him, the actual mother himself. You sure this is a good time to look into that Candyman portal, Helen? Who knows what could happen? Aw oh, shit, that could happen! That scare was actually a legit one, since Bernard Rose sprung it on Virginia Madsen by surprise. Still kind of mad about it. Tony Todd, knowing it would scare her, didn't want to participate, and after Rose convinced him to do it anyway, he ended up apologizing profusely to Madsen. And then, of course, he felt so terrible that I was really scared. But it's alright, Tony. <laughs> Helen runs out of her apartment and finds Candyman waiting for her in the hallway. Believe in me. Be my victim. She runs back inside her apartment, only to find him there, too, standing right behind her. He scolds Helen to the ground for ruining the legend of Candyman. Your disbelief destroyed the faith of my congregation. Without them, I am nothing. And to make people believe in him again, he's threatening to kill her. Though, on the bright side, he does say it'll make her immortal. You could do worse on a deal with death. During their negotiation, Bernadette shows up at Helen's apartment. She hears Helen crying and comes in to help her, only to find Candyman waiting for her behind the door. The actual kill takes place off screen, but after Trevor comes home to find Helen with a knife in her hand, we do see Bernadette's body being handled by cops. Helen is arrested for her best friend's murder, and as she's driven to a psych ward, Candyman talks inside her head and tells her how awesome it is to be a legendary ghost. She should totally try it sometime. Helen is strapped to a bed and left alone, which is when Candyman pays her another visit, floating over her like a beautiful graceful swan. A candy swan! And now he's gone, hidden under the bed like so many monsters, before the hospital staff injects Helen with some calming mmm drugs. Meanwhile, over in Cabrini Green, baby Anthony is being given some much better treatment. Look, he's got all the honey he could ever want. Helen awakens and is taken to see a psychologist named Dr. Burke, who's got some pretty surprising news for her. Now for the past month. Month? Yes. We've been stabilizing you on a heavy dosage of Thorazine. Whoa, what? She's been committed for a full damn turn of the moon already? He plays her a video from the night she was admitted, which shows her yelling at nothing, even though we all saw Candyman planking on her midair. Oh my! I don't understand. Me neither, Helen. Has Candyman been a figment of your imagination all along? I mean, if he was, I totally get it, girl. She asserts her sanity and says she can prove it by calling for Candyman in the mirror. Five utterances later, she gets to say I told you so when Candyman's hook emerges from Dr. Burke's torso. This kill is the major difference between this movie's rated R and unrated versions, which you may have been able to tell due to the change in film stock quality. It's weird, though. I don't think there's anything too ridiculously heinous here. With 
another kill in this candy bag, Candyman tells Helen that she's his now, then frees her from the restraints and straight up yeets himself out the window. Fuck, I love that crazy ass shot. I don't even care that you can see the string. As hospital staff bangs on the locked door, Helen hops out onto the windowsill and makes her way into the neighboring room, where she knocks out a nurse and robs her of her clothes. Yeah, dude, that's really happening right now. With her scrubby disguise, Helen escapes the hospital and runs wee 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 all the way home, right into a freshly painted apartment. And boy, is that color hideous. Who would have ever chosen that bubblegum trash? Oh, Stacy. That makes sense. Get out of my home. <laughs> oh man, that girl just straight crumpled. Yo, Trevor, you see that shit? Where you at, dog? What's the matter, sweetie? Why <laughs> did you make another little boo-boo? Haha, <laughs> no, but you probably just made a little doo-doo. Helen uses her rage to terrify Trevor and Stacy and tells them that the color they picked is a tragedy. Fuck your walls. She's angry and threatening only for a minute, though, before she realizes just how screwed she is thanks to Candyman's gaslighting. It's over. Yeah, pretty much, Helen. Ain't no one or nothing left for you in the city. All you have left is my desire for you. Well, except that. At least you still have that. She returns to Cabrini Green and enters the abandoned murder apartment so she can climb back through the bathroom mirror and see what the candy man has waiting for. Her. Ooh, some candles. That's nice. Oh, and, and a hook. Probably could have guessed that. She climbs up to another floor and finds herself in Candyman's lair, a pad with high ceilings and exposed eye beams that was created by production designer Jane Ann Stewart. Inside this lair, filled with church-like murals of our favorite B-boy, done by graffiti artist Kelly Deco, Helen strangely finds the Candyman taking a little snooze. Wait, isn't that guy a ghost? Do ghosts need to sleep? What do ghosts even dream of? Haunted sheep? She goes to hook herself a big one, but he wakes up right as she sticks him in the neck. And that ain't about to stop the Candyman. Not when he's so excited about Helen coming to visit him, even if it is mostly for the sake of baby Anthony. Surrender to me now, and he shall be unharmed. They have a romantic spin around, which originally lasted a lot longer and included Helen declaring her love for the Candyman. But apparently the studio made them cut it because of concerns over interracial romance. It took two minutes out of that scene and uh, we got word that the studio was a little afraid of the interracial context. They were okay with a tall black man covered with bees, but you know, when it came to a kiss or something like that, it was a little bit too risque. Ever hear of Loving V Virginia? Helen faints and Candyman scoops her up in a tripod stance, then walks her across the room while reciting some very Clive Barker-esque dialogue. The pain, I can assure you, will be exquisite. As exquisite as the pain is going to be, he says their deaths are about to be even doper, since afterward they'll be talked about as legends by everyone in their congregation. Sounds cool, Candyman, but maybe slow your roll with that hook, huh? What kind of girl do you think Helen is? Maybe the kind of girl who's into bees? In that case, here's a chest full of bees! And a mouthful of bees, what? This infamous bee scene was filmed with live bees thanks to bee wrangler Dr. Norman Gary. Gary built an apiary on the roof of the studio, so they could use bees that were younger than 24 hours old, since baby bees don't have fully developed stingers and are less likely to sting. That proved very necessary for Virginia Madsen, who turns out was super allergic to bee venom, and so paramedics were required to stand by on set just in case she got stung. She didn't, thankfully, possibly because Dr. Gary developed a queen bee pheromone. Not only was it used to get the bees to go where they wanted, it also helped placate them. As for Tony Todd, for the mouth bee, he wore a dental plate built by effects artist Marc Coulier to keep the bees from crawling around too much. Although it didn't work 100% of the time. He said he could feel one of the bees had got behind the sheet of latex that I put in the mouth and it was he could feel it crawling towards the back of his throat as, as he was delivering the take. And then he was, when they cut, we just got everything out of there and he was spitting bees out. And, yeah, it was pretty, pretty intense. He did get stung once or twice by the mouth bees. I guess some of them didn't like being in Tony's mouth. But most of the 26 or 27 stings he suffered during production of all three Candyman films happened on his chest, as the bees reacted negatively to the prosthetic design by Hellraiser effects artist Gary J. Tunicliffe. And in case anyone was worried about the well-being of the bees, the ASPCA was on set while they shot this scene, and Dr. Gary cleaned them all up afterwards with a harmless and hilarious 
hilarious bee vacuum. Candyman takes baby Anthony away and leaves Helen to wake up to a bunch of invisible bees and a message painted on the wall. It was always you, Helen. It was always you. I feel like that statement is up to interpretation, but I've always thought of it as Helen being some sort of spiritual reincarnation of the woman Candyman loved and died for. That or he's just gaslighting her more. Who knows? She hears baby Anthony cry and follows his wails outside, where she hears that they're coming from that garbage heap. Another creation of production designer Jane Ann Stewart, who had the city of Chicago truck in a bunch of trash for them to build into a giant heap with safe tunnels in it. The tunnels were necessary since Helen is about to climb inside in an effort to save baby Anthony, using that hook to help hoist her up the hill. Inside Cabrini Green, Jakey awakes and looks out the window to see a hook descend into the trash heap. He's here. So while Helen inches her way closer to the baby she's trying to save, Jake, thinking Candyman's inside the trash heap, enlists some other Cabrini Green residents to douse it all in gasoline while more amazing Philip Glass music plays. I'm coming. Right as she reaches the baby, they light the torches up so they can burn them. They light the heap ablaze and Candyman grabs Helen from behind, intending to hold her captive long enough for all of them to burn together and become a legendary ghost family. Her bones will soon be ashes and we shall never be separated again. Helen breaks free of Candyman's power by grabbing a flaming stake and stabbing him in the bee chest with it. While he thrashes around angrily, she crawls away with the baby, and although a falling beam lights her on fire on the way out, she does manage to escape against Candyman's wishes. Come back to me! See, I would, but like, I've gotta get my hair fire put out. You understand, right? Helen and her weird melty head prosthetic are able to get the baby to Anne Marie as Candyman succumbs to the flames. And yes, I know he's a ghost who already died before, but this seems like another kind of death for him. I mean, the dude turned into a bunch of fire bees right there, and there's clearly a charred body left in his place. That's gotta count for something, right? But Candyman isn't the only victim of this fire. Helen succumbs to her wounds as well, as revealed in a funeral scene that sees her buried. Damn, Trevor, you really about to bring your new boo to your wife's funeral? That's tacky as fuck. At first, it appears as though Helen's funeral could actually use the attendance padding. But her handful of grievers are joined by a procession of Cabrini Green residents, headed by Anne Marie carrying baby Anthony, and Jake dressed up looking like a little candy boy. They're there, I think, because they're Helen's congregation now. And as a way of saying thank you for everything she did, Jake drops Candyman's hook into her grave. A day new mall shows Trevor moping around at home, apparently already bored with his new paramour. Yeah, dude, you should have appreciated Helen while you had her. Now you're stuck with a college student who doesn't know the first thing about knife safety. Come on, Stacy, never cut meat when you're angry. Trevor sobs Helen's name into the mirror a few times, and although the first one is really hard to hear, <laughs> he does say her name five times. After which, well, you know. Flashing lights warning, by the way, cause Helen's jump scare <laughs> is full of needlessly strobing lights. Helen, the candy woman, question mark, kills Trevor with the murder weapon she's inherited, a gnarly bloody hook. And boy, does she love doing it. Flashing lights are over now, cause all that's left to see here is Trevor's bloody corpse as discovered by Stacy, who very inconveniently has a knife in her hand. The movie ends with credits that play over a new painting hanging up in Cabrini Green, a portrait of Helen as a fire-haired myth. Like Candyman promised, she will now live forever. How many people did Candyman have be his victim? Let's find out and buzz our way to the number. What is it? Was it? No, not the bees! Not the bees! Ah! Ah! There were six victims in Candyman, consisting of three women and three men. Although one of the women was just in a story being told, and one of the men was like a, a ghost or something? I don't know. With a runtime of 99 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 16 and a half minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Dr. Burke, since his kill goes on for the longest and involves the most visible hookage. Plus, doesn't hurt that it was followed by that sweet backwards window dive. Doll Machete for lamest kill will go to Bernadette, because the act itself happens off screen, and the body afterward has some weird looking makeup. And that's it. Candyman came out in 1992, and in my opinion, it doesn't get the respect it deserves not only as a good horror movie, but as a good film in general. It's also nice to know that it's fondly remembered by seemingly everyone involved. Making Candyman was one of the best experiences 
that I had. I'm so proud to have been in it because it was it's such a good movie. I love Candyman. I'm pretty sure that at this point, Candyman would be in the first three lines of my obituary, and I have no problem with that. We'll look at the first of its two sequels next week. But until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count. I want to thank a bunch of patrons like Cody Laws, Alexandria Rainwater, Shadow Wesker, aka David Morrison, David Kuhn, Steve Dory, and Grayson Pari. I forgot to mention it during the Descent's Kill Count, but I got a new camera! I'm shooting in 4K, baby. The video's not uploaded in 4K, but I'll get to it one day. Thanks, everyone. Be good people. <laughs>